Okay, marketing. Okay, so we have all of our sales people are running on a 5% commission. Okay, and um, you know, this is not a marketing seminar. I'll tell you though that marketing is a big deal. Because <laughs> you can produce and produce and produce. Anybody can produce. You just make a call to the hatchery and uh, here come the chicks. But nothing, as Zig Ziglar always said, beats you at the top, nothing happens until there's a sale. Okay? And, uh, and I can tell you, even at Polyface today, our weak link, if you ask me, what's your weak link? Marketing. We could, we could quadruple tomorrow with our land base, our, our infrastructure, our tractors, our everything. We could quadruple, to, not the cows, but the chicken, but the omnivores. We could quadruple tomorrow if we had the market. So we eat, sleep, and drink market. Okay? So you can imagine yesterday as I was doing an interview with John, um, and he said, hey, can we work together where you have a box thing that I can offer to my... Man, I'm, 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 I'm on cloud nine today. Maybe we'll work out a deal where, you know, because there are a lot of people that aren't where you are. They're still in the city. They haven't made a move. They want to, you know, but they want to get to a farm that's not dependent on Putin and, and um, you know, uh, um, the, the Arabs. And, uh, and so, you know, we offer that. All, all, all we're dependent on really right now between us and them is UPS. And if UPS goes down... There's, it's going to be a big thing in our country, okay? I mean, these things have just gotten really uh, smooth operations, you know, it, 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 and, 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 and critical, you know, for function. Yes? Sorry, did you say your marketing people are on 5 or 7%? Percent? 5%. 5%. 5% of gross sales. So a marketing person that sells half a million dollars worth of product is going to get $25,000, okay? So what that means is, our marketing cost is a dollar a chicken because remember what I said we're going to sell the average bird for 20. Some of them will be sold for a little less. We're going to cut up some and sell those for 35 or 40. But just for a, for a sake of, you know, just to make it easy, the bird's going to sell for about 20 bucks. Okay. Um, I think I'm not putting a land cost on here because. The land cost is going to be spread over other things. Maybe you're going to have a milk cow. Maybe you're going to have a couple uh, beef steers. Maybe you're going to run some sheep. Um, you're going to run some turkey. Maybe you're going to run some egg layers. So I don't. I'm not going to put the land cost on here. Uh, we have we have birds on a lot of rental land with subcontractors running them. But we put all that land cost against the beef enterprise. The chickens are just cream. Okay. And, and so, so we, run, we run a lot of chickens on rental land, but we don't put a cost there because it's, the land is already there. What about, not, what about losses? Mortality? Yeah. Okay. Um, that, that is partly captured because we're going to put 75 birds in a shelter. We're only, only going to sell 70. And so that gets captured in a lot of this. Okay. Um, and of course, when a chick when a chick goes, uh, they're not very valuable. I mean, it, 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 they it's, haven't eaten very much. But no, they haven't eaten much, and you haven't put much labor in it. Okay. So, but but you know, if you want, I'm fine to to put a you know to put a, a thirty cent mortality on it. You know, it's, it's gonna it's gonna, it's gonna spread across. Um, and also, that changes so much. I mean, you can have a you can have just a a stellar batch, you know, weather's perfect, no predators, you know, everything's cool. And then you can have one that just, oh man, they they come in weak. Uh, they're like maybe they were the last eggs from a breeder flock, and those are always or there, there's inconsistency. Um, we've you know we've changed hatcheries over the years. You know, where do you get them? Well, I always say, you know, uh, when you start, get try about four or five different hatcheries and uh, what you'll find is uh, that some will do better than others and the hatchery that consistently can get them to you fortunately we're big enough that we can act we actually drive to the hatchery in Pennsylvania and bring them home they don't go in the mail 
but most of you would get these in the mail. And it's amazing how sometimes the hatchery that's located close to you simply doesn't have uh, as smooth a, a uh, USPS, um, you know, air delivery system or whatever. Or, uh, well, anyway, just, just, yeah, you want to try a couple. Okay, I think, I think, unless I'm forgetting something here, I think I've got everything. So, let's add all this up. Five, eleven, sixteen, twenty, eleven dollars for a bird of expense. And what did I say we were going to sell them for? Twenty. That leaves us a margin of nine dollars a bird, which is up there, you know, in about a 45 40, 45 percent margin. Everybody follow me? Okay. Which, which, if our goal is 30 to 35 percent, it gives it gives a little bit of wiggle room. Okay. Can I make a comment? Excuse me. Can I make a comment? Yeah, you sure can. So some of us may live in places where it's hard to find the 30 cent a pound feed, and it's important. To, I think it's really important to know this process because your number may change based on that, and then your price should reflect that. There's a big push to not charge people what our food is worth. You should be getting paid for putting your blood, sweat, and tears into it. So, that's right. I love that you went through this. Too. Yeah, yeah. That, that's how you do this. Yes. Does your feet contain soy? Does our feet contain soy? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, okay. Uh, it contains soy beans. I'm going to make a great distinction between soy and soy beans. All of the studies that have impugned soy have been with soybean meal. Soybean meal presses out the seven essential oils that are in soybeans to make soy oil, you know, uh, oils. And so I have a problem demonizing a whole food because when you break it up, it has stuff you don't like. For example, high fructose corn syrup comes from corn. So I'm not going to eat corn on a cob ever again. Because that's where high fructose corn syrup comes from. Okay? I think we all realize how silly that is. And, and so, um, so, the whole soy thing to me is part of that issue is that we have broken it up. And one of the reasons I'm saying that is because the American Pastured Poultry Producers Association, APAPAPA, which is the trade organization of pastured poultry in the U.S., did a feeding trial several years ago on this very question. And they ran, they ran a two-year, they ran, dub, doubled it, they did it twice. And what they found was the most estrogen, that's the issue, estrogen in the birds, the most estrogen was not in the birds fed anything with soy, it was in birds that had access to a lot of white clover. If you've ever raised sheep, you know that the clover estrogen cycle when breeding sheep is a... Is, is a big deal. Don't have time to go into it now, but it is. And and so my my question as I stand back is, so are we really not going to let our chickens eat white clover? I mean, that's their favorite thing. Of all the green, all the salad, white clover is a chicken's favorite thing. We're not going to let them eat. Sometimes I think we get too smart for our own good. And and, and we've always got to we always got to have a demon to fight, right? I mean, that makes us feel righteous and makes us feel, you know, good. And so we got to have a demon to fight. And so here's the deal about the salad, the green material. Chlorophyll is nature's number one detoxicant. I'm not sure that's a word, but you know what I'm saying. Detoxifier, whatever uh, form of that word there is. Uh, and so we do everything on our farm to make sure that the birds get all the green material. That's how we move them before we have a cup of coffee. 
because chickens are the first animal up in the morning. As soon as, soon as this starts getting light, chickens are up, they're, they're up and around, okay? If we wait until 9 in the morning to move them, the dew is off, the grass isn't as, as tender and palatable, they're not as hungry, they've been up and already gotten into some feed, and uh, they're not as active, and, um, and, and we've lost that window. So, uh, so we, we do everything possible to make sure we, we graze the grass ahead of them with the cows so the grass is short. A chicken can't, they can't masticate a blade of grass like a cow can. They can't, they can't, mat, they can't get it in their beak. Now a turkey can, but a chicken can't. And so we graze ahead of them so the grass shoots are nice little tender shoots. That encourages them to eat those shoots. We don't want to run through you know, tall grass. So there are, there are a lot of things that we do to make sure that those birds ingest as much green material as we can. And as you can imagine, for us being in the, in the fringe of this movement all these years, we have encountered every kind of, of fringe um, wellness thing. We've had people come and, uh, and uh, dangle pendulums over our chicken. We've had people come and, uh, and submit it to crystals. We've had people come and put it in uh, uh, biodynamic chromatograph uh, uh, spin circles. Um, okay? Um, and <laughs> and we, we've, had, we've had one uh, come and put it on the uh, o, o, Osiris, you know, the, where you hold the things and you, and you put the food on and it gives you a, a frequency balance. I mean, we've had every kind of, in addition to empirical, you know, uh, tests and, uh, or, you know, more Western science type stuff. And so far, we've never had a chicken that didn't, you know, hit, bump the top of the things. Oh, I've never seen a one this, you know, good before. Even though we feed, now, we do use GMO free, okay? And every batch of our feed is checked for glyphosate. Which, by the way, organic certification does not do. Uh, they don't check every batch for glyphosate, and so uh, so a lot of times the issue with soybeans is that they tend to be a liver crop. They like suck up and then strain a lot of stuff out of the soil. So in a so in a toxic soil situation, they tend to concentrate toxins. And I, I, I get that. To me, that's a bigger deal. So the GMO-free, glyphosate-free deal that we get um, ameliorates that. Here's the problem. So if you're not going to use soybeans, what are you going to use? Well, you can use, um, you know, most people use flaxseed. Flaxseed is extremely expensive, and it's not grown very many places, and it's highly unproductive. So now we're going to bathe everything in 2,000 miles of diesel fuel from the Dakotas, importing flaxseed. Oh, well, let's not use flaxseed then. Let's use um, let's use additional fish meal. That'll give it to us. Okay. So now we're going to incentivize uh, these atrocious Japanese dragnets that that uh, that deplete the oceans with their bycatch. That's what you know the fish meal is. Um, and so now we're going to further deplete the oceans. Now we're not going to have salmon and, the, and sort, you know, the, the carnivorous fish uh, that are the, the top of the food chain in the ocean. Now we're not going to have them anymore because, you know, we're going to take away all the, all the bycatch. So th th there, are, there, are, there are issues here. Uh, uh, it, it's not as simple as it might just sound. So we depend on the grass. We put everything in our management and our grass to make sure that the detox detoxification happens if there is any and, uh, and, and and go along. That's not to say that if you had an old Rhode Island Red, a New Hampshire Red, an old traditional heritage bird, they're not race car, NASCAR, high octane, double breasted birds. Okay? And so they can get by on a lot less. You could raise them, um, you know, with some with some uh, alternative protein. I mean, you can if you're real small, I mean, you can, and we, we've looked at other things. We've done, you know, earthworm beds, soldier flies, uh, uh, mealy worms. I mean, there's there's a million little, and if you want, if you want the best homestead scale uh, manual on this, it's Harvey Ussery's 
uh, book, Harvey Ushery's, uh, what's the name of this book? Small uh, Scale Chicken. Small, yeah, Small Scale Chicken. Flock. Flock. Small Scale Chicken Flock. Yeah, yeah. He has probably done better than anybody else in truly uh, raising a backyard flock without grain, you know, without other inputs. But it's a, you know, it's a big deal, and I can tell you when you head commercial and you start into one, two, three, five thousand chickens, uh, to be able to get, um, I mean, I just I just was at Health Centers of America up in Front Royal this week, and there was a guy up there that had mealyworm kits uh, for home, you know, uh, to, so you could raise your, raise your own mealyworm kits. It was, it was a wonderful thing. It was a cool little thing. And uh, now I stopped by, and, and, and the problem is for us to do that, you know, we'd have to have a thousand pounds of mealyworms a day. Well, suddenly now you have one person employed full time, uh, you know, doing uh, mealyworms, which you know is not outrageous, but you've got to feed the mealyworms. So now you got to buy buy something to feed. Well, he says, well, you you, know, you you use food scraps from town. Well, we're on a dirt road. We've tried and tried and tried to get uh, you know uh, food scrap uh, stuff on, on our farm, and and we're just too far out to make it to make it viable, and. Uh, and, and, and for some reason, our chefs that we deliver to don't like to go, don't like to see us putting their scraps in the same truck that we bring their food in. They just, they just don't like it very much. So, you know, these are all, these are all issues that, that, are, that are hard to, they're, they're hard. It, once a system has been segregated as much as ours has, to reintegrate it is not a simple matter. And so sometimes you just have to do the best you can with what you, where you are, and you wait, you wait for adaptation in other, in other areas. Hey, Joel, yeah. are you still a proponent of Nutribalancer? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, the poultry Nutribalancer, when everybody, whenever anybody calls me I got sick chickens, are you using Nutribalancer? From fur trial. Can you also use ACV in their water? Or? Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will tell you though that um, that wellness. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna have a bunch of chickens here. How's the water coming? It was 137 about 15 minutes ago, so it should be good. Okay, so we're close. All right. Yeah, I think we're good. So one of the most interesting um, uh, charts I ever saw, because as you can imagine, we've been in this long time, and we've tried all sorts of snake oils. Different things, you know, um, NutriCarb, um, um, uh, uh, bacterial things, all sorts of stuff. And and uh, years and years ago, NutriCarb, uh, Leonard Ridson, he always had the, the full back page ad on Acres USA magazine. And um, and I mean, it was it was just the claims were out of this world. And so you know, I thought, oh, I have to try that stuff. And um, so we got a barrel of it, and we killed the chickens. And so I had a friend that was a naturopathic doctor, an MD, naturopathic doctor, and we talked about it. And he gave me one of the most interesting charts I've ever seen. So if we have wellness up here and sickness down here, he said, in our linear Western reductionist mind, we always think that there's some line between sickness and wellness and we're somewhere on that line heading you know on a line heading to wellness but he said that's wrong because wellness doesn't go to infinity okay he said the way it is I'll use a different color just to express it the way it is is a bell curve okay and <clears throat> So if you're, if you're sick, the procedure to bring you to wellness, if you continue it, often takes you down the other side. That's why you go, you have an infection, the doctor gives you an antibiotic, he says take it all, but when you're well, quit. Why? Because if you get, quit, keep taking it when you're well, you become an addict. Opioids are a perfect example. You're stressed, you take an opioid, you get a little more stable, and then you become an addict, and then you slip the other side and you become, you become an addiction. I mean, my perfect example is fasting. 
Okay? Fasting is really, really good for you. I just last month I did a three-day fast. Okay? Three days. Three days without eating. Okay? It's really good for you. It helps to clean you out, makes you makes you sharp, uh, feel better. Okay. Well, I feel so good, I'm just gonna continue fasting. <laughs> I'm here, I'm gonna continue fasting. Then what's gonna happen? I'm gonna start it out, right? So that's a perfect example. And so what he said was, what he said was, the reason that Leonard was getting such tremendous benefits from Nutricar in Tyson and Pilgrim's Pride and chicken houses was because those chickens were way down here and this carbon-based uh, material glummed on all the toxins, you know, and, and, and the chickens were able to flush out and they were able to, to do better. When we gave it to our chickens, our chickens were already up here at Wellness and it became a toxin sitting down the other side. And I've never forgotten his... his uh, do you find that fascinating? I do. I find it really fascinating. And so so our idea is to get us to wellness. That's why um, you know our, our pod, I, I do a podcast with uh, Dr. Cena McCullough, Beyond Labels. That's our, our podcast. We do it once a week. The weekly podcast. And she is the she is a quintessential researcher. I mean she is just a pit bull researcher. Um, PhD. And we wrote the book Beyond Labels, some of you saw it here yesterday. But uh, she says she says that's why a lot, a lot of this dieting stuff, all sorts of things, um, has such tremendous benefit early on because our bodies like change. And so you go to a carnivore diet or you go to, I mean, you know, you, there's a bunch of them, right? And, and you always, oh, this works great, you know, for four or five months. And then, and then it starts to go the other way and uh, and so so she you know she she advocates actually um, changing things up once in a while you know and and uh, just change it up I don't think she would ever ever advocate going to a Dunkin Donuts diet <laughs> <laughs> but but you know it's good um, it's good sometimes to go for example uh, no fruit for a month for example for example I, I, I'm, I'm trying to channel Cena here. Hard for me to do. But you know, uh, uh, try one month, no, no fruit, for example. Try one month, uh, only meat. Try one month, uh, no sugar, zero, no carbs. Okay, uh, and, and just just fluctuate it, and and it and it and it uh, it helps your body to, to adjust. Okay, are we ready to go do some chickens? Any any other questions? This has been this has been. Uh, been really good, yes. Um, what type of permits do you have to have? Permits! Yeah. Ah! Permits! <laughs> okay. Uh, so, the thing you have to know is Public Law 90 492. PL 9492. So it's 1967, 68, I think 68, 1968. U.S. Duh said we gotta, we gotta upgrade and modernize meat and poultry inspection in this country, and they passed the Wholesome Food Act. It's funny how almost every single piece of federal legislation is the opposite of what it actually says. Like the Affordable Care Act and like the uh, and you start down that road. Okay, so the Wholesome Meat Act. Well, in 1968 the today's large factory, you know, Tyson Foods, Purdue, Pilgrim's Pride, Anderson Farms, these were all fledgling companies in 1968. In fact, in 1950, the average flock of laying chickens in America, the average, was 100 chickens. So this phenomenon of factory farming is very, very recent. And in the continuum of human history, it's extremely it's a blip 
I mean, it's not even a, a sliver. And so, um, so there were so many neighborhood outfits. I mean, in the 1950s, get this. In the 19th, you read uh, Vertical Diversification by D. Howard Dove, one of my favorite books. I don't think it's in print today, but boy, somebody should reprint that thing. Um, D. Howard Doane was um, uh, he was a, he was a, a an ag consultant. Um, I don't know if he was ever Secretary of Agriculture. I think he, he was in like 1910 or something like that. Well, late in his life, they asked him to write a book that 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 would capture all of his ideas, and he wrote Vertical Diversification. And his whole theme in that book was instead of instead of horizontal diversification, like I grow corn, now I'm going to grow barley, and I'll grow chickens. That's horizontal, adding adding commodities. Instead, vertical diversification was how do we diversify, take, take what we're growing and diversify it vertically. So if you're growing corn, how do we grow our own fertilizer? How do we grow our own seed? And then that's below the point of production. And then above the point of production, Suppose we, instead of selling corn, we turn it into cornmeal, and then we turn it into cornbread muffins, and suddenly, off of two acres of corn, we make a full-time living because instead of instead of running, you know, uh, uh, a one a one penny a bushel margin, we're now running, we're now wearing the hats of the the marketer, the distributor, the processor. And, and we're wearing all those middleman hats, and we're you know we're, we're, our margin goes way up. So that was that was his whole goal. And in that book, in the 1950s, with no licensing and no inspection whatsoever, you could butcher chickens in your backyard, can them, take them down to the post office, and mail canned chicken to your city customers through the U.S. Postal Service. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if we could do that today? How entrepreneurs like us would compete and run circles around Costco and Walmart and, and Cargill and, and the big operators? You know, we don't need antitrust legislation. What we need is liberty. Okay? Just give us a little freedom and we'll run circles around these guys. Okay? So anyway, we'll wrap the trail. Um, so, PL 9492 was part of the 1968 Wholesome Foods Act because at that time they couldn't stop all of the small poultry because there were too many people still dependent on little little uh, chicken operations that were home processing, serving their neighborhoods and their communities. So they carved out an exemption to inspection called Public Law 90-492 called the Producer Grower Exemption. It's a federal carve out that if you produced up to 20,000 chickens a year, you could do so, harvest them, and sell them into the H-R-I, H-R-I trade. That stands for hotels, restaurants, and institutions. The legal term here is end user, okay? Obviously, you can sell them to individuals, but you can sell them to any end user. And that allowed you to do 20,000 chickens as a producer grower. You couldn't process somebody else's chickens. And you couldn't take your chickens to somebody else to process. But if you wanted to process your own chickens, you could do it without inspection. The only requirement was that it had to be sanitary and unadulterated. Now that is clear as mud. <laughs> sanitary and unadulterated. So if I asked all of you what is sanitary and unadulterated, we'd get... 30 different answers, right? And so the ambiguity of, of the regulation was good and bad. It was good 
in general, I think the good outweighs the bad because in ambiguity becomes wiggle room for the argument. Okay? And I am confident that our success in this space has been created or, or uh, facilitated due to the ambiguity. All right? Of course, the downside of ambiguity is it allows a tyrannical inspector to interpret uh, against you and you know that that's a problem but the ambiguity which happened which happened to us but the ambiguity gave us wiggle room to fight back and we won and we won several times uh, so so this uh, this is really a, a wonderful thing and and does not exist by exist does not exist for the other amenable species uh, beef pork chicken uh, turkey lamb it does not exist for them, which is another reason I'm so bullish on chicken, is because you can do chicken without inspection uh, and just and just uh, and and start a direct retail branded product uh, easily without a lot of hoo ha and and capture and own it. I mean, the day the day we take every time we take beef to the slaughterhouse, our artisanal product interacts with the commodity system okay and so um, but with this with the chicken we can keep that chicken all the way to your household which gives us additional integrity it allow it anyway it, 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 it keeps you from having to interact with the, with the commodity system now um, this is a federal law. About 30 states have adopted it, and about 20 states have become more restrictive. And the um, APAPA, American Pet Pork Research Association, has a, a, a list of what states are what on this continuum. Some states have gone as low as 1,000, some 5, some 10, some 15. Okay? So they're everywhere in between. Interestingly, Nebraska, Nebraska, when they did theirs, they did not have a mathematician making their law, and so they put in, they put in for, um, I think it's they they limit it to five thousand, five thousand chickens, and. In the regulation, they said that a turkey was 0.25 chicken. <laughs> they meant the other way around. <laughs> but they wrote into the law 0.25, which means in Nebraska you can do 20,000 turkeys. <laughs> And only 5,000 chickens. All right? Just a little clerical error. Um, so I don't know, you know, I, I can't rattle off what all the states are. But my advice is on these things is just start. Don't ask, don't tell, don't start. Now, don't do a bunch of blanket advertisement, don't do a bunch of uh, social media, just let it be on the, on the, on the QT. Down and low, friends, neighbors, acquaintances, let it get out there. Do some, uh, uh, I mean, you can certainly do some, some uh, uh, social media marketing, but be, uh, but be gentle about it. Um, don't make a big deal about uh, we hate the government and we, you know, are, are uh, thumbing our nose. You know, no, no, no. These are our chickens. Uh, if you like one, uh, holler, holler or something, okay? And, um, and, and you just start. And the thing is, if somebody doesn't like what you're doing, I mean somebody like a bureaucrat, uh, they are not going to fine you. They are not going to throw you in jail. The first thing that will happen is a visit. And they, you'll get a call or something. You visit, all right? So <clears throat> you do not interact with them. They do, under this law, have a right they have a right to come to your place and determine if you are are adulterated or 
unsanitary. Okay, so that they like to see some stainless steel. Um, they like to see. They might. They might ask for a water sample, and that's one that we have not fought. We did not fight them when they demanded a water sample. We decided that was not a hill we were willing to fight on. Because how? What are we going to do? We don't care about how good the water is. It, you, you just. You know, you just can't do that. We took a water sample, we ended up putting a UV filter, a UV light on our well. Uh, you know, thousand dollars wasn't too bad. Um, so, so if they start into, you have to do this, you have to do that, have, no discussion, everything's in writing. We don't talk to bureaucrats, we don't talk to regulators. Everything's in writing. If you don't write it, it doesn't happen. And that slows them down by two years. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can build your business, you can you know, get your customers up, you can get ready to, you know, to, to write letters to your congressman, whatever. And we've involved our elected politicians on every battle we've had. We've, we've gotten our politicians involved, both Democrats and Republicans. For the Democrats, they're trying to shut down an environmental farm. For the Republicans, they're trying to shut down an entrepreneur. So you message it, right? And we have found extremely good uh, um, you know, uh, support from both sides of the aisle on that. So, um, yeah, be, be smart about this, but don't worry about it. Uh, just go for it, and uh, and the worst that'll happen is you're going to cease and desist one. But a letter, okay? And when you get a cease and desist, then you can work with it, okay? All right, let's go to your okay, so Let's take just a quick bathroom break yeah. for everybody. We'll That's meet good. over there. I have one person with a book signature. Okay. okay. All right. Before you, before you butcher. Yep. <laughs> yep.